Many of us in the Latin American diaspora view Marxism as a Eurocentric theory that uh, doesn't uh, a Eurocentric theory that isn't applicable to our region's history and therefore an inefficient an inefficient ideological tool with which to bring about change in the present. Many, especially the younger diasporic Latin American uh, community of activists, view Karl Marx himself as a racist, and they even argue that the funding that allowed him to write Das Kapital uh, could be traced to colonialism and, and slavery. And although I think this, this latter claim is a bit of a reach, um, I, I do understand why there's a resistance to him, uh, his work, and, and the ideologies that have come from his work. Passages like um, calling Mexicans lazy, and where he refers to Simon Bolivar as some sort of uh, Bonapartist dictator, um, are spread or are circulated among our community as proof of this racism or antagonism. Um, so a question we have to ask ourselves today is, can a theory that was, or that has roots in 19th century Europe be relevant to Latin American Marxist thought in the 21st century? And I think in order to answer this, we must look to the contributions of Jose Carlos Mariategui, uh, who has influenced Latin American Fought, or Latin American Marxist fought since the 1920s. We know that when Ernesto Che Guevara um, was a young man, he traveled to a leper colony in Peru's Amazon rainforest. And at this point, he was just a, uh, a young doctor, quite apolitical. Um, he, he was on some sort of gap year before going on to practice his medical profession. Um, and at this colony, one of the doctors gave him several books to read. And he said that uh, these books changed the direction of his life. He said that the books, together with talking to this particular doctor, inspired him to want to fight for socialism in Latin America. Um, the doctor who gave him those books, or the among the books he was given was the seven interpretive essays of Peruvian reality, and the doctor who gave him those books was Hugo Pese, which is a close friend of Mariategui and uh, one of the co-founders of the, the Communist Party of Peru. Um, the impact that Mariategui, that Mariategui and Pese had on Che Guevara was so strong that when Guevara and the Cubans <coughs> The revolutionary Cubans overthrew Batista's government in 1959 and they took over the national press. One of Guevara's first requests was for them to publish the seven interpretive essays. Um, che Guevara's theory of applying Marxism to local conditions and centering rural communities is a direct influence of Mariategui and not just of the Chinese revolution and Mao Zedong, as is usually suggested. Although Guevara made an official policy to uh, republish Mariategui's work during the revolution, we know that he had, he already had an influence in Cuba uh, among intellectuals via his magazine Amauta in the late 1920s. Um, the scholar Mark Becker shows that the magazine had a direct impact on Juan Marinello and Juan Marinello, Marinello became one of the um, most prominent ideological contributors of the revolution 
in fact, he's considered to be uh, one of the intellectuals who convinced che Guevara, uh, Fidel Castro and the 26th of July movement to take a socialist path after 1959. Um, the underlying idea was that Cuba needed a socialism that was its own and that they shouldn't copy, uh, they shouldn't just straight copy European Marxism. And so obviously that goes back to uh, Maidetegui's famous quote where he says, certainly we do not wish that socialism in America be a tracing and copy, but it must be a heroic creation and we must, with our own reality, in our own language, bring Indo-American socialism to life. In Colombia, where I'm originally from, the scholar Alberto Pinzon Sanchez uh, tells a story of when he, he and other students were first introduced to revolutionary Marxist literature at university in the late 1960s. And he recalls that one of the tutors gave uh, some students in their class a project, and it was to read the seven interpretive essays and present it to the class. And this group was shocked that a book that was written in Peru decades earlier was so relevant to Colombia and to the uh, social, economic, and political situation that they were going through at, the, at that time. Um, one of one of the um, members of the study group was Boris Zapata Mesa, who later became a uh, quite a well-known anthropologist in Colombia, and who became uh, one of the leaders of the Unión Patriotica uh, political party that the gov that, that the Colombian uh, government committed a genocide against in the late 80s, and he himself was killed in 1989 by a uh, right-wing paramilitary death squad. Another member of that group was Guillermo Saenz, who um, was later known as Alfonso Cano, and who joined the FARC guerrilla and became one of its most, well, its ideologue for decades up until 2008, when he became the, the leader of that organization. And he was killed in 2011, just before the peace process, even though he was uh, considered to be, or he's, he's still considered to be in Colombia, uh, they, they call him the architect of the peace, or the architect of the peace process. And like in, in Cuba, Mariategui's influence in Colombia began way back in the late 1920s, both through his literature among intellectuals as well as through communist activists. Uh, recent research that I conducted about communism in Colombia shows uh, how Fidedigno Cuellar, a young Colombian communist, heard about Mariategui's <coughs> work, again by uh, Dr. Hugo Pese, and was inspired to go and live and work among indigenous Colombians in the Cauca department. Here, Cuellar built up a powerful self-indigenous communist including a uh, communist, including a young indigenous leader called Saudo Josa, who became one of the founders of the Marxist FARC guerrilla, alongside other indigenous communists like Charro Negro, Ciro Trujillo, and Major Liste. The fact that the Colombian Communist Party had several indigenous co-founders and central committee members since the early 1930s and who nominated the first indigenous presidential candidate in 1934, and that these indigenous Marxists went on to found the region's, the region's longest lasting and most powerful guerrilla army is not by coincidence. Mariategui certainly played an essential role in convincing communists that indigenous people needed to be at the forefront of the struggle and helped to convince indigenous people that Marxism could be used as a method to bring about decolonization and social change. What we want to convey by telling their stories and their contact with the seven essays, um, their first contact with a Marxist reading of the region 
is that it had a profound effect on them and inspired them to take action, to try and alleviate the ongoing oppression suffered by the masses, rural and urban in their country. This isn't to say that this book alone was the reason why Guevara and, the, and these revolutionaries gave their lives to the struggle, but I think it's clear that it played a huge part in inspiring them to fight for social, political and economic justice. And it was able to do so because it spoke to their experience, to their experience of the world around them. Concisely, Mariategui continue to influence Mariategui's continued influence on Latin American Marxism is this it cannot and should not be applied as if it were a universal law he was the first in our region to introduce Marxism as an intersectional theory and that took into account local configurations the legacy of enslavement, racism sexism, colonialism. The orthodox Marxist premise of the worker versus the bourgeoisie was, wasn't enough and there were other factors to, to be considered. In this sense, he can and should, in my opinion, be compared to the great Marxist thinkers and revolutionaries in the third world, such as Mao Zedong, Walter Rodney, Thomas Sankara, Amika Kaudal, and so on. Uh, some quick points on, on the seven essays itself. Uh, in short, the seven es essays are a collection of articles that outline Peru's history from a socialist or a historical material materialist lens. And one of the innovations of the book, apart from prioritizing the political role of indigenous and rural peoples, is that it places Latin America within a global context. In essay one, for example, he shows that Western imperialists, especially the British, were after natural resources, and this relation to capitalist core nations influenced the region's economic underdevelopment. In other words, he's telling us that we aren't backward nations because, um, because we are naturally or inherently incapable of development, but that we are underdeveloped because we are forced into an unequal relationship to capitalist imperialist nations. This formulation alone has been an ongoing source of dignity for our people because it allows us to see our situation from a broader context. Theoretically, this was the basis for future Latin American Marxist thought, including the famous neo-Marxist dependentistas or dependency theory. An example of this in the seven essays is when he says, from the standpoint of world history, South America's independence was, the, was determined by the needs of the development of the Western or more precisely capitalist civilization. And then he goes on to say, Peru's economy is a colonial economy. Its movement, its development are subordinated to the interests and the necessities of the markets in London and New York. Our latifundistas, our landowners, whatever their illusions of independence, are in reality only intermediary agents of foreign capital. So here you can see that he's describing neocolonialism and dependency before these terms were defined by academics in the 1960s. Another passage that I thought we could uh, discuss today is where he states, the degree of development achieved by the industrialization of agriculture under a capitalist system and technique on the coastal valleys has its principal factor the interest of the UK and the US in the production of sugar and cotton in Peru. The best lands of the coastal valleys are planted with cotton and sugar and sugarcane, not so much because they are suited to these lands, but because they are crops that currently matter to English and Yankee business. And this quote, I think, is as true today as it was back in his time. Um, though, of course, it's expanded from just sugar and cotton to many other natural resources. To conclude, the genius of Mariategui was that he was able to take Marxism and make it relevant to our region's history, as well as the conditions of his time.
He was also innovative in the sense that he showed us that we need to fight the global capitalist system as a simultaneous fight against colonialism, imperialism, racism, machismo, sexism, and even urged us to decolonize education and art. In this spirit, we mustn't look to Mariategui as a religious-like figure who can provide us with a universal truth, as we shouldn't look to Marx and Marxism for a universal truth. But rather, we should take uh, his uh, methodological approach and apply it to our present conditions. So it's this combination, this very early practice of intersectionalism that has made Mariategui relevant to Latin American Marxism up until the present and perhaps it's time for us to learn his ideas here in the West. And most importantly, not just learn from his ideas, but let them inspire us so that we can go out in the world and do what we can to bring about tangible change.